welcome <coughs> to our series uh, in this week. Um, we are uh, in a real treat. Actually, this is sort of the start of uh, several presentations on observational studies and sort of the um, issues related to Here's Pan Lu, uh, one of our uh, biostatisticians here. I think most of you probably know him. He uh, <coughs> worked with them for almost two years. Uh, yeah, almost two years. Yeah. Yeah. August. So uh, he's going to start uh, our series off uh, with kind of an introduction to observational study uh, and uh, then talk about his development. You announcement, housekeeping sorts of things. Um, if you're uh, <clears throat> listening online, we ask that you would uh, mute your uh, mic unless you ask a question. Otherwise, I think we get feedback from that. Um, if you run into problems online, uh, use the, I guess the chat feature of, of uh, Blue Jeans. And if you're interested in previous presentations, they are available on the CTR website. Um, there's a sign-in sheet back there, here. If you want to get credit for it, uh, you need to contact RFA. Um, what else here? Um, next week there won't be a presentation, but the following week uh, we'll continue the series on observational studies. Uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, uh, and there's also actually a schedule through, I think, August that's back there if you'd like to upcoming presentations. So, without any further. Okay, thank you all for coming. And, uh, but yeah, today uh, I'm, to, I'm going to uh, give a talk about this uh, observational study. Um, actually, uh, it's a uh, Part of my research is uh, on causal inference for both uh, observational <coughs> study and uh, uh, experimental studies. So uh, when I when I asked it to give a talk about this topic, uh, yeah, I'm so glad to to share some of my experience and the knowledge in, in, in this area. And uh, this is a topic is for uh, for the whole uh, observational study series. And uh, today is the first one, so. Uh, so I will talk about the overview of the observational study designs and also introduce an instrumental variable based, uh, based approach. And uh, so after this, and the second and third one is focusing on the statistical method in bus adjustment, especially based on the, uh, uh, especially the propensity score based approach. So the, the last topic, uh, is, is about how to improve the robustness in statistical inference to address uh, observed confounding. So um, I will be the presenter too. So this is the outline of uh, today's talk. So uh, it consists of two components. The first, first part uh, is the overview of the observational study. It will uh, include um, definition, type of studies, and also uh, how to evaluate the, uh, the procession and validity of observational study. In the second part, so I will introduce this instru instrumental variable based uh, uh, approach. So what is the instrumental variable and how it works in observational studies. And also I will introduce some applications. Let's go to the part one, the overview of uh, observational study. So as we know, so evidence-based study in scientific research is to identify the best practice through collected evidence, their research, develop, development, and analysis. So this evidence could be, you know, any type of media like uh, data, like text, or uh, even voice or some data from the internet. So in order to have a, uh, you know, in order to make a best, um, make a good study, in order to make a good, uh, this research, so we need to use a, a lot of uh, study designs. So different study designs are applied in different research purposes and provide information of different qualities. So, uh, especially in, in medical research, 
I list some uh, research purpose that we most consider in, in our study. And for example, like uh, the cross-sectional study in describing the pre uh, prevalence of some uh, health problem, or like a cohort study or a case control study in identifying causes of some health outcomes, or evaluating therapy including treatment and the prevention, or some uh, even called the quasi uh, experimental designs in improving uh, health efficiency. So um, in today's talk, I, I will talk about almost uh, uh, you know, most of these study, study designs. So I, here, uh, I draw a simple uh, graph to, to demonstrate the, the main type of uh, study designs in medical research. So, so typically, the study designs um, uh, in, uh, include uh, observational studies and randomized control trials and also called uh, quasi-experimental studies. So most of you may, may be very familiar with uh, or maybe partly familiar with uh, uh, observational study and uh, randomized control trials. And uh, you may not be very familiar with because it's uh, the quasi, uh, quasi experimental studies. Actually, you know, this is a type of study so in between of the observational study and the randomized control trials. It has some uh, compromised property between these two. Since the, the quasi experimental study and the randomized control trials are both have some uh, design intervention, so it's been called a experimental study. And in another way, observational study and, and, and the quasi experimental study usually is not a randomized study, so it's belong to non randomized trial. So this is just a, a, a simple structure of the type of uh, study design. So in today's talk, we're going to mostly focus on the observational study. And uh, I will, you know, part of introduce this uh, quasi-experimental study. But, uh, I will give you just a small piece of idea about the randomized trials. So although uh, today's talk is uh, mainly about the observational study, so I must do uh, here want to give you some uh, small piece uh, idea about the randomized controlled trials. So ideally we know the randomized controlled trials are, are able to investigate the effects caused by the treatment through random through random treatment assi random treatment assignment. So this randomization is also being called some golden standard because it uses a chance to form the comparable groups to avoid the treatment difference or selection bias in both married and uh, unmarried characteristics. So, but what do we know? We cannot conduct uh, the randomized control trials everywhere. You know, since uh, sometimes it's not ethical, sometimes it's not feasible. So usually, when the randomized control trials uh, can be can be can be conducted. Uh, for some uh, human subjects, you know, when some uh, set conditions being satisfied, first, all of this competing treatment under, stud, uh, under, under study either harmless or intended to benefit recipients. Second, the best treatment is unknown usually, and the subjects considered to be randomized. The, the third one, the third is uh, the investigators can control the assignment and the delivery of the treatment to be effective. So we know it's, it's not easy, you know, for investigator to find a study to satisfy all of these conditions. So when the randomized control trials are not ethical or not <coughs> even feasible to the experimenters, so we usually would like to use the observational study to detect the effect of some treatment or explorers. That's why, in some way, we pray for observational study. So, in contrast to the randomized control trials, so th actually there's no official definition for uh, observational study, and uh, so usually we believe. Uh, so, so, so usually we say a researcher observe and collect information in a natural setting, and not try to. You know, Change the subject. Uh, change the subject being observed. 
So simply speaking, so in observational study, there's no intervention. Observ observational study has, has its own properties. So usually, it's an empirical comparison of treated and control groups, and it may not be able to infer cause and effect relationship. So in another, in another way, compared with the randomized control trials, the observation study is more diverse and, and flexible, especially usually they have a very larger sample size and with a lower cost compared with the randomized control trials. Observational study is also very useful in, pra in practice since it's, it's provided information on the real, on real practice, text the signals of risks and benefits, and help us to, to, to formulate the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis for future randomized control trials. We know the, the cost uh, for the random, randomized control trials is very high, so usually we cannot just uh, conduct uh, randomized control trials uh, you know, without any you know, previous sense or information. So observational study usually been used to help us get some information or sense for, for the study and to help us to, to, to form some uh, hypothesis in future randomized control trials. In observational, in observational study, so the, the most important problem is, is, is a confounding problem. So, so this, especially for the confounding associated with the treatment and outcome simultaneously. So typically, there are two types of uh, uh, the confounding or bias. One is called uh, over bias. So this bias is variables that has been actually measured and been observed. Another one is called the hidden bias. So, so these are those variables that have not been measured, but are suspected to exist. So these two types of bias or confounding could fundamentally <coughs> Would fundamentally jeopardize our you know, research result if we don't do any adjustment for this. So based on the, the, the property of the observational study, removing biases and addressing uncertainty are the central issues in, our, in observational study in statistical research. So we, we try to you know, remove all, all, all of this uh, bias or confounding and to ensure the, the comparable group are compared and the competing treatment. So it's just like uh, we would like to make the comparison in observational study looks like a, a randomized control trials after, you know, uh, after the assessment for, the, for all type of confounding. So usually uh, the overt biases can be removed through some uh, statistical modeling adjustment. So you, you may very you may familiar with some of them like a covariance adjustment, so matching adjustment, stratification, weighting, so on and so forth. So most of this method uh, will be discussed in the second and the third seminar, conducted by Dr. Zhu Gui Zhang. For hidden bias, so usually this cannot be addressed by some popular statistical modeling. And so hidden bias usually cannot easily be identified for some observational study. So we usually address this hidden biases partly in design of the study, partly in analysis of the study. And so later we will see so instrumental variable is a new technique or is a good idea to deal with this hidden biases. Observational study design can be distinguished by the, you know, you, the ob objective of your research study, how the subjects sampled, and the time of data collected. So I also draw a simple plot here to show the observational study include cross-sectional, classically, it includes cross-sectional study, case control study, and cohort study. And we can, cross-sectional study is, a, is a simplest the one, so it requires a, the, the lowest results, and uh, so it's easy to, to do. And uh, but uh, the result from a cross-sectional study just uh, may not that uh, may not co contain that so much information. So it usually been uh, very 
prim uh, primary or pilot study to, to gathering some information for the future study. And uh, case control study and cohort study will give us more information, but it will request more, require more resource. So I will introduce all of these studies one by one. So the first, the type one is cross-sectional studies. So a cross-sectional study is a study design in which explorer and outcomes are determined simultaneously for each subject, so which means uh, we, we collect all the data through a single survey. There's no any follow-up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, any uh, re recall or any interview for the, for the past information and so on. So cross-section is equal to the no directions, so which means uh, it's not possible to identify the exposure and outcome relationship. Yes, we don't, sometimes we don't even know so which one is the out, uh, outcome, which one is the, which variable is the, is the outcome, which variable is the, the exposure. So I, I, I write here the very small example is uh, if someone would like to to analysis, so what is the, the prevalence of diabetes in this community? So we may, the result is that we may find some, um, you know, different uh, uh, distribution of the of the diabetes in this community through like different gender, different uh, education level, uh, or different other fact, fact, uh, factor variables. So we may not even know so which one is cause uh, cause which. So it's not sometimes, most time it's not feasible, you know, to identify this exposure. And outcome relationship. This is simple, so it, it's been widely used to understand the prevalence of various conditions, treatments, services, or other outcomes and the factors associated with these outcomes. There are some issues in this uh, cross sectional study. The, 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 the important one is that since the data collection is based on a single survey, so the outcome related or t so the outcome related or time dependent covariance can easily affect by the subsequent events. So which means uh, uh, sometimes, so if you do a, a, a cross section study at this time point, it may have a different result compared with the same cross sectional study in another time point. Some variables could be affected by the time dependent covariance. For the case control study, so is another type of the observational study, which is a uh, kind of more popular than uh, I cannot say more popular, which is by actually every study type is very popular. So case control study is to compare the individuals who have the outcome we call the cases group with the individuals who do not have the outcomes we call the controls, so according to the past history of the exposure to factors. So Look at this graph. So usually, the study to begin to selecting some sub subjects with some disease, and uh, this is uh, called the case gr case groups. And uh, we we look at uh, the past history and to see the proportion of the patient with disease is exposed exposed or not exposed for some factors or some or some um, treatments. And uh, we also find the, the control groups. So this, this group patient without this disease, and we also find the propo proportion of the exposure or exposure to some factors or some, or some treatment. And we make a comparison between these two groups to see what's the difference. So this, this, this difference could give us a sense about how this exposure affects the disease. This control study is, is, is more practical in epidemiology study because uh, it gives us some chance you know, to detect causes. But it may suffer from other disadvantages. So the most important disadvantage is called uh, recall bias. So as we know, so all the exposure was being collected based on the patient recall. And uh, it, it may contain, you know, a lot of errors or bias. So usually, people believe so. So 
so patient in case group more likely to recall past the exposure. Uh, I think uh, it, it makes sense because a patient who has disease may, you know, may pay much more attention on their pa on their some risk exposure, or may have a, you know, more correctly recall their past. So an another big concern is a, is a, is sample selection. Uh, this sample selection for case control study is more complex. So so first. We need to collect enough case people uh, subject for the case, case case group. We hope this patient, uh, you know, can come from a variety of sources and can represent the more, more more population. And for the control groups, we hope we can we can collect the the enough subjects. Which can ensure the comparable comparability between two groups. That means we, we, we hope these two groups has a very similar patient, and we can make these two groups comparable. So case control study is, is appropriate when the outcome is rare. So we know it's it's uh, it's hard to find so many people in the in the case groups, but in that situation case control study is more appropriate. And also, there's a reliable evidence of, for the past exposure. So we know if we cannot, if we, we don't have any chance to identify the, the past exposure, at least uh, we cannot conduct this case control studies. So the, the, the famous example is just the, the study between the tobacco smoking and lung cancer. We know we cannot do the, any cohort or even single trial studies for that. We we usually use the case control study, the case control study design for that kind of research. Another type of uh, observational study is called a cohort study. A cohort study design is that subjects are followed over time, so which begins with individuals who are expo exposed and not exposed to a factor, and then evaluate the subsequent develop development of outcomes. So this, this picture shows clearly the structure of this cohort design. And uh, the, the study uh, began from a uh, uh, select patient to the exposed and, uh, and unexposed groups. And uh, so after the follow-up follow over some time, you know, we found the different the, the disease proportion between two groups. And we would like to test how this uh, exposure or, or, or treatment affects its disease level. The cohort study is also a form of a longitudinal study, so allowing us to, to, to study the change over time and uh, establish a time sequence in which things occur. So it's possible to detect causality. Like, like what I said, if, if we can you know, address all the confoundings, we can exactly know how this uh, exposure affects this disease or outcomes. But cohort study also has some its own properties. So first, the cohort study may be the either prospective or retrospective. So it depends on when subjects are identified. So we can collect the patient first and, and then to follow up them to find the, okay, well, what what outcome we can have, and all we can collect the patient already have some outcomes, and to, to retrospectively look at so how when the patient has been exposed. So another well, a potential issue in cohort study is a missing follow-up due to the outcomes or coverage related reason. We know. All this outcome will be collected after the exposure, and uh, so sometimes some study may even take a, a, a years, may even take years to to collect that outcome. So it's it's very possible to to miss some uh, some uh, patient. So it if this missing if this missing is caused by some uh, related to some outcomes or coverage, it could cause a, 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 a big problem. So we need also to address this missing data issue. In, in case in cohort study, confounding issue is also also possible in this cohort study. 
and in both in both before and after follow up. So before follow up, it could uh, affect how the treatment assignment. So after follow uh, so after th th this uh, follow up, this could affect uh, how the compliance issue. This could uh, the patient even be assigned to this group or select this group, but the, this patient may change it to another group. So cohort studies uh, are more appropriate design when the good evidence on association between the exposure and outcomes. So this evidence you know, sometimes may, may come from a, a cross-sectional study or, or other previous pilot study. And also the outcome is not very rare since uh, finally we needed to compare the proportion of some disease between two groups. If the some outcome is too, too rare, so it's, it's very hard or statistically it's not feasible to do that. So, for example, uh, this is one of my uh, past studies to uh, is, is, is to uh, detect the breastfeeding reduce the risk of uh, child obesity. So we we follow up the the, pa the the baby to take breastfeeding or non breastfeeding, and to and uh, after four years we would like to compare the 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 child obesity level between these two groups. I, I find this uh, picture from the, uh, the internet, and uh, this gives you a basic sense to comparing the time-dependent studies. So we can see the, the, the case control study and, and the retrospective cohort study is a, is a study you know, based on the past. So this is the start time of this is start time of the study. So we case control study is a given case and control. We, we we compare the risk factor frequency, and and the retrospective cohort is a we just uh, record well, which patient is in uh, in exposure and unexposed groups, and we compare the disease the the level in, in, in this time. And uh, for the prospective uh, cohort and even clinical trials, uh, is a is a follow up studies. So we we. Uh, Assign the patient or patient select the expert group by themselves, and and after a time of follow up, and we we compare the disease levels. This give you a, a basic sense about these studies. So now I would like to uh, talk a, a little bit about the called the, the, the quasi experimental designs. So quasi experimental designs are the studies uh, that follows between observational studies and randomized control trials. So it has uh, the, the uh, compromise of properties. So it lacks observational study, but there are also the intervention. So as we know, so in, in observational study, we only observed what happened. We only collect the data that's already there. So there's, no any, there's no intervention. So but it, it also like randomized control trials. It is, uh, lacks at least one of the characteristics in randomized control trials. In most cases, we miss uh, randomization. So, so it's it's also a non-randomized trials. So, plus I, uh, experimental designs needs a moderate resource, but it can provide relatively reliable results. Here is a, a, a simple plot to show. Uh, as an example to show how uh, this uh, quasi experiment, uh, experimental de design works. So for the, the, the target population selects uh, select the, the treatment and control group usually by themselves since there's no randomization in, in this quasi experimental design. And uh, we, so we measure the, some pre intervention. Outcome and uh, post in, uh, post intervention outcome and make a comparison for uh, the difference uh, uh, before and after this intervention to detect the effect of this intervention. We also use this no intervention group as a control to avoid some uh, time dependent confounding. So quasi experimental designs are also called a natural experiment, uh, natural experiments. So, which are effective? Which are effective because they are using called the pre-post testing model to minimize the variation and uncertainty. So pre-post, so we can think we still focusing on the same subjects. Or this, this subjects could be a population, or could be a, a device, or could be a, some units. So, and 
it can avoid some confounding, especially, you know, suffered for other uh, type of studies, uh, other type of the observational studies, because uh, we we focusing on the, the same subjects. But it make, but, but other type of confounding could, could jeopardize this result, because this is, this, this study uses compare pre and post result. So if this result depends on or associated with, the, with 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 time, so it could be confounded by some time change the issue or, or, or confounding. So a classic type of the quasi experimental design as a like a so as a non equivalent group design, regression discontinuity design, or even time series design. So uh, I may not have time to go over all of this type of design one by one, but uh, uh, I will give you a very example here to show uh, to show what is a uh, quasi experimental design. Actually, this is a study I worked with uh, him uh, to to investigate the some intervention effect uh, uh, on improve the tr transition time from ED to SAU increase in the care. And uh, we collect the data from 2010 to uh, 2013 and uh, to show the how the weekly average uh, ED length of stay changed uh, over time and before and after some specific intervention. So so he here we can find uh, the, the the time trend, th this job is, is caused by some intervention. The special intervention is uh, conducted in this time period. So it's, we can easily compare, you know, there's some effect of this intervention effect on this ED length of stay for the t over this time trend. We assume if there's no time dependent confounding for this result, we, this result is causally interpretable. Means we focus on the same unit and uh, Although it's it's data being collected over time, if, if we assume there's no any time dependent confounding, we can trust this result. For observational study, we also uh, I also uh, I would like to you know talk about some uh, evalu evaluation of a uh, uh, recession and validity issue. This too is, is also important when we conduct an observational study. So first, let's look at evaluate, uh, the evaluating the precession. So precession refers to a lack of a random error or random variation in study estimate. So this random random variation arises from a, you know sampling subjects or marrying variable incorrectly. So this tells us so how to collect data and how to correctly or accurately collect the data uh, it is also a very important issue in observational study design. This, uh, this could dramatically cause the, 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 the model variation and uh, to make the, the result not that reliable. So another issue is a small sample size and unbalanced groups reduce the study efficiency and power. So this is easy to understand. But sometimes uh, when we do a, a study design before uh, any study, we would like to have some basic sense about a sample size uh, in overall or in each groups. So however, if the randomized control trial, so based on the hypothesis and uh, based on the you know, data structure, and we can calculate that. However, in observational study, so usually we don't know so this study could suffer from some um, unobserved bias or confoundings. So usually a small sample size, or sample size just based on, calculated based on the randomized control trial, it's not large enough to deal with that unmarried confounding. So my suggestion is that if, if it's possible to get as much as possible in your study. And so that's why we need, uh, in another way we need a more a sophisticated method in a statistical analysis to help us to improve the precession in observational study. So validity is also a big issue. 
So validity here refers to lack of uh, systematic error. Observational studies uh, are evaluated in terms of both internal and external validity. Internal validity refers to the strength of the inference from the study. It partly depends on the, uh, uh, the data and partly depends on the, the model assumption and uh, uh, analytical skills. So if the treatment cause, uh, cause the effect in the outcome, so we, we can claim so this is a high internal validity. So if systematic error causes the effect in outcome, so we call this a low internal validity. So which means if the if this out, change through the outcome, so mostly come from the systematic error or some confoundings, so we know this 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 for this study for this specific study, the, the internal validity is very low. And um, another another one is called the external validity. So its ability to generalize this study results to the more universal population. So we know we can a study. Actually, uh, a good a good study can should be practically you know generated to other uh, similar type of studies to give you the uh, similar results. So if the if if this study cannot be repeated or cannot be generalized by other people for the similar or same outcomes, so it's it's it does not, so that means this 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 study. So suffer some ex uh, external validity issue. So usually, uh, internal validity is a prerequisite for the external validity. So a, a good, uh, you know, estimation or a good model for the result is is a you know prerequisite for the external validity. Also, you know, external validity is very low. Could you know it's because the sample the sample size is a, is very small or the sample size is not not that representative. Just uh, you know, focus on this local data or this piece of data cannot be interpreted by other data. Okay, uh, let's move to the second part called the instrumental variable design. So the motivation. So as I said, so the, the central challenge in, in observational study is to remove pretreatment bias to ensure the, the comparison between groups. To make this comparison close to the randomized control trial as mostly as possible, and uh, but we also know the most statistical adjustments uh, are capable adjust the overt or, or, uh, or measured bias only, since uh, we we don't know we don't sometimes we don't know so what variable could uh, fundamentally affect the outcomes, so. They have to claim this called no hidden bias assumptions in most uh, statistical adjustment. So no hidden bias is a very strong assumptions since uh, it, it cannot be identifiable empirically. So we don't even we don't even know there, there's exist or not some hidden bias. So there's some hidden bias theory sometimes because we 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 have we don't have enough knowledge or we don't have a uh, you know, good theory to detect this this uh, this uh, this hidden bias. So instrumental variable design gave us a new ideas. It's attractive because it can consistently consistently estimate the average causal effect of an explorer on outcome without this no hidden bias assumptions. So this sounds like a dream come true. Okay, we don't have to. Uh, you know, worry about the, that hidden bias, and we can get the consistent estimation. Um, yeah, in some way, I can see that, but uh, you know, it's it's not um, not a you know piece of cake. It's not easy to sometimes it's not easy to get it. So for the instrumental variable, you, instrumental variable method, you know, have a very long traditional in uh, econometrics. And, and recently becoming increasingly popular in biostatistics and epidemiology. Uh, here, uh, I have to use some formula, you know, but it's easy to understand. Okay, let's consider we would like to model some outcomes of Y based on some uh, explorer X through some uh, very simple linear regression model. So, so Y is denoted as uh, is the outcome. 
X is some explorer. It could be a binary, categorical, or even continuous. So beta is some parameter. It's a it indicated treatment effect or the explorer effect. The U here typically is an error term. So uh, I assume everybody f familiar with this uh, simple linear regression. And uh, we know, although it's, it's, it's very simple, it's beautiful, but we can not use it just, uh, you know, just uh, without any you know, consideration. We, we know there's some assumptions we needed to, uh, this need to be uh, satisfied before we use this model. So one is, so uh, one of the important assumptions for this li uh, simple linear regression is called uh, independent assumption or no association between this error term u and this regressor x. We assume these two variables are independent of each other. So through through this graph, so we can see, we can see, we would like to detect the effect from x to y. So u here is some error term. No matter how this u affects this y, as long as this, this u is, is uh, independent with this explorer variable x, we we can correctly or consistently estimate this parameter beta. So it can yield the we call the ordinary least square estimated beta of, of, of this. So everything looks beautiful. So however, so think about this. If there's some confounding in this study, so this is you. This 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 could be, this this U could be uh, uh, overt and hidden bias. This U affects this X and Y at the same time. So it could be some company affects the exposure, also affects the, the, the outcome. So if we don't address this, it could cause some problem. So at that, the, at that time, so the simple linear regression model becomes this. This U is some function of X. As, as, so right now, this ordinary least square estimate is not a consistent estimate of the, this true parameter beta. So we can find this estimation is become, become, become this true beta plus the derivative from u to x. If this, two, this u is independent with x, we know this term is zero. If this u is some function of this x, no matter if it's positive or negative, so we know this not equal to the true parameter value beta. So this could cause some problem. So now, so I would like to introduce a, a, new, a new variable called the instrument variable. So an existing variable z is called instrument or instrument variable so if it satisfies some conditions. So we put z here. Here, if we can find a variable z. First, condition one, so z has some causal effect on x. So z has some causal effect on x. The second condition, the z Z affect the outcome, the Y, only through X. So that means Z do not have the direct effect on Y. All the effect from Z to Y have to through X. And uh, the third condition is that Z does not share a common cause uh, with outcome Y. So which means uh, all of this confounding, no matter if it's, uh, it's uh, uh, observed or unobserved, does not affect variable Z to Y. Z can only affect x to, and affect y, but cannot affect the variable z. So this z is called instrumental variable. If we can identify a variable z like this, so no matter how this confounding affects x and y, we can get a consistent estimate of this explorer effect. Let's see how it works. Before we discuss the instrumental variable design in observational study, I would like to use some. I would like to use a, uh, like a, a double-blind randomized trial as an example to to show how this uh, uh, IV variable uh, IV uh, estimate works. Uh, let's think about uh, we have a, a double-blind randomized trials, but we through randomization and assign the patient to, to the different treatment group. And the, the patient and the different exposure or treatment. And finally, we got some outcomes based on the different uh, exposure groups. 
if we if we if this study is not well controlled, which means this study this randomized trial may suffer some non compliance issue. Which means if the patient be assigned to the intervention or treatment group, that's not mean that this patient will follow or will take this intervention. So we still suffer the problem patient could select a different treatment by themselves if this study not is are not well controlled. So if this compliance issue occurred, so it looks like this. We have some confounding. This confounding could affect the exposure and affect the outcome at the same time. If we would like to find the effect from exposure to the outcome, we cannot estimate them directly. This, this confounding directly has this effect. However, we found we have a randomization variable here. This variable looks like a satisfied all the conditions I introduced before for the instrumental variable. Is that true? So first, we know this randomization definitely affects treatment exposure. So we assign the patient to the different, randomized assigned patient to the different group. We assume this, this, this treatment assignment definitely affects the, the patient's decision to choose, uh, choose this uh, treatment or do not choose this uh, this treatment. And uh, since we use the randomization here, we assume this confounding does not affect this, this randomization. And also, how the randomization effect is come from this exposure to this outcome. So we, there's no direct effect from this randomization to the outcome. So it looks like all these three IV conditions have been satisfied. So for example, if we assume this Z is a it's binary variable. That means we have two treatment groups. So it's, it's ready to show that we, if we only consider this randomization effect, we call the intention to treat effect, can be defined as this, like uh, the mean in the treatment assigned group one, uh, in, the, uh, in the treatment group one or treatment group two. However, if we would like to identify the real causal effect from exposure to the outcome, it's equal to this. So it's, 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 it's different. So it gave us some sense. So in randomized control trial, if this if this not, study in not well controlled, so randomization could be a potential instrumental variable to be used to identify the true exposure effect. So this is a this this is this example is come from the randomized trial. In observational study, we know there's no randomization here. Only start from the exposure. Patients just select their exposure or treatment by themselves. So there's no this term. There's no this variable here. For, for, for observational study, if we can find some variable, so this 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 variable is a we call it the z-like variables that made all these every conditions. So it allows us to detect this exploratory effect on the outcome, no matter you know what, what kind of compound is there. So this is the basic idea of the so uh, the IV estimate in observational study. Um, I know it may maybe not easy to, to understand that. Uh, is, is that easy, or how can we find a, a instrumental variable? In some uh, uh, observational study, so here I would like to uh, give you some uh, examples to show how this uh, instrument variable can be used in some observational studies. So the ex first example is a very traditional study: is the smoking and lung cancer studies. So usually people would like to detect uh, how this smoking affects the lung cancer, but we know that we definitely know we cannot conduct a randomized control <coughs> trial. And we also know there's a lot of uh, merit and a uh, merit of confounding over there to affect the smoking and lung cancer at the same time. But can we find a good instrumental variable? Some people may suggest that we use a tobacco tax as an instrumental variable. Is that good? So we need to, to test, or we need to at least identify the, sat the satisfaction of those three conditions. So 
the first we know, we, we would like to see the, the, some cause effect from the tobacco tax to smoking. So for, in order to demonstrate this, I copied this result from a study. So it has been shown that tobacco tax significantly affects smoking rate based on the data from Pennsylvania from 2000 to 2009. And we can see this, the, the, the tobacco tax rates in, 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 2000, in, in 2000, the end of the 2003. So we, we can dramatically see the, the smoking rate change over after this tobacco tax. So, so this result tells us so the first condition is satisfied that this, this tobacco Z has a causal effect for this smoking. And uh, we also think this, all of this confounding, no matter if it's married or unmarried, which could potentially affect the smoking and lung cancer, does not affect tobacco tax, since usually this tobacco tax is determined only by government, not by any um, risk factor could affect the smoking or lung cancer. And we also assume the tobacco tax uh, has no direct effect on lung cancer. It's, uh, it's, it's not, it does not make sense. But we also think all this effect from a tobacco tax to the lung cancer have to, have to through this smoking. So this is a very, this is a, very, a typical idea about how to choose or find an uh, instrumental variable in an observational study. Here, I would like to show you another example. This is also a very uh, famous example called the uh, Mendeleev randomization analysis. So this, Mish and uh, Abraham uh, has mentioned it. So, so this sentence, they said, the growing success of IV design in biostatics and epidemiology can be mainly attributed to applications in genetic uh, epidemiology. So all, he said this because uh, they get some ideas from this uh, Mendeleev randomization analysis. This analysis uh, so originally derived from the idea by the Caton in his um, 1986 paper in, in Lancet. So the author's idea is to test the hypothesis that the lower serum cholesterol increases the risk of cancer. But we know we cannot conduct the, the, uh, the randomized control trials. And also, this uh, this serum across the level, uh, cholesterol levels, uh, uh, to the to suffer some, you know, marital or unmarital confounding, such as uh, the diet or smoking, since this this risk factor could affect the, the cross level, the, the cholesterol level, and and the cancer at the same time. So, so, so the idea is, can we find a good so the uh, instrumental variable in, in these studies? So. The author suggests found the APOE gene was known to be associated with this uh, serum uh, cholesterol level, which not affected by the confoundings, since all of these genes only depend their uh, by their parents' genes. So at least we know, okay, looks like uh, it satisfied the first condition. This gene has uh, been associated with uh, this uh, serum cholesterol level. And also it looks the second, second condition has been satisfied. That as is a uh, the, the confounding is not is it's not being confounded by the uh, it's not being affected by the confounding since only it it's only depends on the parents' gene and uh, also this genotype affects the disease this, this is a cancer in, our, in this study only through this 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 phenotype and exposure we call the serum uh, serum cholesterol levels in this study so so looks like uh, we 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 find a good instrument in this study. So the idea in Caton's study is, is to test the, the causal effect between serum uh, cholesterol levels and cancer by studying the relationships between cancer and the genetic and the genetic determinant of a uh, serum cholesterol. Mendeleev randomization analysis is to is not to identify the individual at risk based on a genotype but to mimic the effect of some exposure of interest. So Caton did not you know, do uh, IV uh, design in his study. 
but his idea has been learned by uh, many other uh, uh, researchers. And uh, now it has been widely used in, 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 matter of, uh, in many studies to test the causal effect between this uh, uh, phenotype and some disease. So a famous study is uh, the high uh, cholesterol level on uh, coronary heart disease risk. This study has been published uh, in 1994 and 2002 in Lancer. Uh, another example here, what I would like to show you here is a retrospective cohort study. Actually, um, I would like to say, you know, it's not always a good story. So, uh, so sometimes it's, uh, it's not that easy to find or identify uh, IV variables. Um, so Burkhardt and, uh, and uh, Sneewis so used a, a retrospective cohort study by comparing the effect of two classes of drugs on GI bleeding to demonstrate the performance of the instrument variable design here. And uh, the author used the, the physician's uh, prescribing uh, preference uh, as, a, as an IV. So we would like to check does this, uh, this variable satisfy the IV conditions? So first we assume, they assume this, this PPP is associated with the exposure. Since, uh, I think it's, it, it, it kind of makes sense. And the PPP does not share the common confounder with outcomes that with this GI bleeding. We, we assume you know, some, this confounding affect the, the, the drugs and uh, affect the, the, the drug choice and affect the GI bleeding does not affect the uh, physician's uh, the, the, uh, preference. Uh, they also assume this PPP affects the outcomes only through this prescription. So, but some researcher may challenge their choice in this study. So they, 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 they said the proposed IV is unmeasured since we, they, can, they did not, not measure the physician's prescribing preference directly since it's not that easy to, to measure that. So they just use the last prescription as a surrogate IV. It, it may cause some problem. Also, they said the preference of the, this, uh, this COX-2 drug May, may be related with other treatment preference impact by the GI bleeding. Or the patients with high risk of bleeding are more often to see the physician who prefer the COX-2 drug. So all of this could potentially you know, broken the, 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 the satisfaction of the IV conditions and may also cause or bring some errors you know, in, in, in this design. And uh, we so they compare this uh, some result by different estimation method here. So we found uh, the traditional N adjustment estimation is, is 0 0.1. The so adjustment estimate for known risk of, uh, factors is, uh, reduces result to 0 0.07. So, so this difference is, is used to uh, uh, adjust the measured confounder. And uh, we, if we use the IV estimate, the result changes to negative 0.18. And also compare with uh, the similar uh, result, uh, uh, result from a similar randomized control, uh, randomized study, it's a negative 0.47. So, so we may see it's it's although the IV estimate gave us some give us a correct direction about this this, this this effect. However, it still have some difference between the randomized control trials, which means uh, it's not that even there's some variables. Uh, there could be broken some uh, condition, IV conditions, or it could be um, other, other, uh, we don't, other, that means uh, it's not good for, for, for this IV variable in this study, since it cannot satisfy all of these three conditions at the same time. Okay, let me uh, stop my. Uh, uh, so today I, I, I talk about the observation study. So, uh, so I just want to summarize one sentence. It's understanding the strengths and the limitations of each type of study designs will help us to find the best possible de uh, design. It's, it's very important. Also for the IV, so for the IV design, it, pro it provides an idea to avoid address a, a merit confounding, but we should be very careful on IV identification since some of the conditions are not empirical, so identifiable. 
So we still need to use our knowledge or experience or even some uh, previous study results to help us to identify these every conditions. Also, every design may suffer from other problems, especially for some uh, you know, complex study design, you know, and such like uh, so exposure is a uh, time varying or multiple exposures or even outcome is not continuous. So, so all of this so open questions or the challenge, you know, still motivates us to you know, develop a new theory method and to you know to solve all of this problem to make this you know method you know better you know in future. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs>
can still affect this result, but we didn't have a chance to detect that. Maybe we can try this every method to give up as another choice. We don't have to worry about all of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.